This is Jake with the Tattoo Improvement Network. Be sure to join us January 22nd through 24th in Austin, Texas for the Star of Texas Tattoo Art Revival. www.golivefast.com for all the info that you need. Hey, welcome to Fireside Tats, the official podcast of the Tattoo Improvement Network. Go to tattooimprovement.com. What are you going to do when you get there? Sign up for our newsletter. We have a newsletter. Are you on it? I'm not, but I would like to be. Oh, yeah. You need to be. We uh, we often send um, naked photos of Adam Shaw. Uh, a lot of times we'll, also known as Dark Light. Captain. We'll uh, pre- pretty often I'll tweet out my, or what do you do on a newsletter? I'll send out what I, um, what I had for lunch. A lot of times I'll take a photo of that, shoot that out to you. You know, important yeah. shit like that. Hey, my name is Jake. I'm the host of the show. Oh, uh, while you're at it, while you're signing up for our newsletter, go to um, go to uh, Facebook. It's, it's Fireside Tats on Facebook, Tattoo Improvement on Instagram, and Fireside Tats on Twitter. We try to keep it real. We really mm. don't want people to find us. What we're looking for is an educated listener base. I think because mm. we don't want a bunch as of, small as possible. As small as possible. We don't want a bunch of morons. If they can't find <laughs> us, but based on all of our different names, we don't want them. <laughs> Because really, yeah, they say there are no stupid questions, just stupid people that ask questions. <laughs> so we're trying to dodge the stupid. I don't know if that's what they say. <laughs> I'm here with Carrie Dunn. Yeah, I'm here with Carrie Dunn, uh, known as the Godfather of tattooing. He's. Uh, I've never done a tattoo in my life, but uh, um, I've been, Yeah, but that's what they call. Yeah, me. they call him the Godfather yeah. of tattooing. <laughs> Uh, and we're gonna, and we're at Studio Eighty One. If you guys are fans of the show, then you know, uh, you know the studio. This is Christina uh, Haven Studio. We have a different setup now. Uh, yeah. We're at a different part of the studio. It's a giant place. And so we're here. Um, I'm doing a workshop with uh, with Carrie, and this is day three. Mm-hmm. And you're from? Are you live in Philadelphia? Are you from Philadelphia? Is that true? Uh, n- uh, I've been in Philly for about twelve years. I'm mostly from Jacksonville Beach, Florida. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, that was a that was like a huge uh change in temperature and yeah and before people. jacksonville i was in colorado oh okay yeah so when i was a little like... kid so that was so what's worse for change. cold is 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 colorado worse or philly Ooh, that's a good question uh it's hard to say i mean i would probably say colorado even though it's a dry cold it's oh, it's still, still definitely cold. yeah colder but it's yeah. prettier or no is it I, to, to, only... to philadelphia yeah definitely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I've only yeah. been through Philadelphia once, but I don't remember any real mountains or anything. <laughs> um, I love Philadelphia. Philadelphia is Philadelphia is definitely a kind of a gritty city. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's not for everybody, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you moved there to study at Studio in Caminati? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's which what is, took me there. Which is where you teach now. Correct. And yeah. for those of you who don't know, that was so Nelson Shanks helped to set that up. Was he an instructor there as well, or just like a board member? What was his role? Um, he had been talking about opening a school for a long time, and finally, it's enough people around him sort of motivated to make it happen, and so they finally did. And I was lucky enough to be like kind of in his class at the Art Students League in New York like the year before and I had kept uh-huh. in ta- contact with him and it's, and then that happened a year later. Um, and so he was the principal, he's like the principal teacher at that school early on. So I kind of like, when people ask me like, what what is an atelier or like, what is what was it like? I mean, I always kind of say, well, if you can imagine like a, a martial arts dojo, you know, you got the crotchety little master who, who yeah. sort of like comes in, he can still kick everybody's ass, you know what I mean? Right. And like, and then he's got his top students and they sort of teach down to the next tier. It's very much like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So did you study under him directly at, at both schools? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So would you, so is your process kind of, have you a, like, basically adopted his process or is that you've like have a hybrid as far as like your approach to painting? Uh, I definitely sort I would say that he was my principal teacher. So my, he was like my main method, but since, and I think that's a good thing to have like a main method yeah. um, rather than lots of methods that you try to compile into a main method. Not that that can't be done, but um, you know, and then since then I've kind of, you know, you, I think you sort of naturally kind of, you know, branch off into other things. 
and and learn other methods and kind of pile on to it. So yeah, yeah. You know, but, but and that's been been fun to do. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've talked a little bit about that in a few episodes, and I think actually Paolo, who we, Paolo Casey, who we were just uh, we interviewed last time we were down here, um, yeah, the cheesy chicken. We talked to him, and he, he had that um, he made that same point about how important he thought it was to at least establish um, a, a solid base under a single uh, like mentor uh, mm-hmm. before yeah. you start like branching out. I I did not. I I would I um. Uh, I mean, I, I was a painting major in school, but I didn't have a single men- mentor there. I kind of bounced around the, the painting department, and then I didn't paint for a long time, and then I started bouncing around workshops. And it's proven to be a little bit of a struggle because mm-hmm. um, yeah. I think we've shown over the course of a lot of episodes of the show that, that a lot of times you get great results from a lot of different painters with completely different approaches and completely different mindsets on right. on how they work. And, and when you kind of throw yourself into... Um, uh, into a week with this person and a week with this person and they say completely contrary things. You're just like, oh, they both right. make nice paintings. Who do I listen to? <laughs> but, but so yeah, definitely there's some, there's some uh, value in like learning the fundamentals from a single teacher, huh? I think so, yeah. 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 So can we like just a little bit go through, um, we're three days in on this workshop, by the way, and, um, and it's been obvious so far that you have a very kind of deliberate process, like how you approach. Will you kind of run through whether it's, your process or what you learned from Nelson or kind of the studio's process, whatever you feel. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely based on Nelson's, my, my main teacher's basic process. Certainly it's based on that, but I, over the years I've picked up other things from going to museums and just standing in front of paintings in the museums. I just, you know, you pick up things, um, you know, other like workshops I've taken with other, other people, they explain things and, and they're all kind of explaining the same thing, but in slightly different ways. And so, um, and so, you know, you keep doing these workshops and over time you, in every workshop I do a little differently. Like sometimes I don't even know exactly. I mean, I was debating today this morning, whether or not to do a three day painting or a one day and then a two day. I was, I was actually not sure, you know, yeah. so. I kind of keep doing them a little bit differently just to kind of keep it fresh and, and keep it dynamic for myself. So is it just to kind of test how people respond or is it, is it just to keep it fresh? I mean, uh, um, to test how people respond. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, do you keep doing shorter stuff, uh, um, for the repetition or do you go into something longer, you know, cause both are good. So it's, it's sometimes right. I'll just try to sense what the group I think is what might be best, in, you know, in the middle of the week. Or something. Yeah. Is there any like hard and fast rule? Like we, for the most part, we have a group, we have a small group, this, this workshop, but most of them like, uh, have a pretty solid foundation. Everyone can draw fairly well. And yeah, it's a pretty, pretty solid group. It's a pretty solid group. So what do you, and that's always great. Yeah. It's always nice. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so would you, would would you tend to have a a group that, that had a decent base, uh, a decent foundation? Um, would you tend to have them do longer poses or would you tend to have them, is there more value to one than the other? Like, if, if if you have a group that doesn't draw very well, would they would it make more I, sense for them I to do always, longer poses? I, I kind of think I always think that shorter poses are actually better. Okay, uh, just because I think repetition is really good because that's how I trained was mm-hmm. was through a lot of repetition, a lot of starts, and not really worrying too much about trying to get to some sort of completed finished thing. Um, and the more you can run through something over and over again, the more it just sort of logs in those same principles and methods into your head. You know, I think that the more that you tend to like, you know, every time you go through it, you kind of, I don't know, things stick more. Yeah, so. I, I tend to agree. I think <clears throat> most everyone in the workshop um, would say that uh, we all did what, maybe a three hour pose yesterday and then we had a full day today. Mm-hmm. And I think most everyone would, well, maybe a couple of people not, but most everyone would say that they got, like I was happier with my shorter pose than I was today, but maybe because I had more time, uh, and I didn't feel like when, when you have less time, maybe you're more deliberate just because you know, like, well, I only have three hours to do this. So I might as well like get in there and and be bold. Uh, whereas if you have eight hours or three days to do something, maybe you're a little more hesitant or you're just, you kind of go back and forth and like him and haul and what you want to do. Right. Right. You have more time to like, to think about things that, maybe aren't really super important, yeah. um, to, you know, and so when you have short, a shorter amount of time, it forces you to, you know, to economize your thinking process. Yeah. 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 So as far as the actual <clears throat> approach goes, like how, um, just, uh, 
from from start to finish you you've started with a lot of very angular marks trying to find relationships really quickly um as far as when what your teaching process you're um you're, you're starting with kind of a monochromatic wash you're really trying to block in thinking about large shapes um large diagonals really right is that kind of a is that a nelson shanks kind of idea or is that something you adopted from someplace else or? yeah I, I would say i learned that from from nelson because he really again advocated like the shorts the, the, the starts mm -hmm. you know lots of starts lots of starts you know like um you, you know you can't really do a great finish unless it's built on top of a great start and also a great middle stage i, I would say um um <clears throat> yeah so you're um and then typically, are, you like to also work kind of dark to light, which is real similar to, to tattooing. We all tend to work dark to light. Thanks, by the way, to our sponsor, uh, <laughs> Barrel and Barley. Uh, two right, doors down. Two doors down, downstairs. We really appreciate the growlers that we paid full price for. <laughs> uh, they were really, they were pretty chatty. They were, yeah, they were nice guys. Yeah. Like, it's a cool little place. If you find yourself in Woodstock, swing by. Um, uh but um, you work. You tend to work dark to light. Or really, it's yes. more like you start more in mids because you're not really getting your darkest darks early on with these washes. You start with kind of a grisaille or whatever, and uh, so you're you're basically kind of working in a monochromatic way at first, and then punching darks, and then working to lights. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. So, and you're you know we're first separating uh, shadows and lights. Right. And then in the light mass, it's the old master idea of working from dark to light. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you know, that idea keeps coming back up over and over again in my experiences. So, and, and you tend to see it when you look at the old master paintings. And so just that general idea when working from dark to light, you know, it's called modeling towards the light. And, and it just seems to work better when anytime you're putting light paint on top of dark paint, it just works so much better somehow. I don't, I don't know what the magic is, but to, to get a sense of the light bathing the form and then less so as it turns away from the light source. Anytime you try to put a darker, darker tone on top of a light mass, there's a tendency, I was saying it in this week, there's a tendency, it kind of looks like somebody just put dirt on the surface yeah. rather than a, a downturning plane. So it's the, you know, I try to work from dark light as much as possible. However, that's not to say you can't mm -hmm. start with sort of a mid-tone or a darker mid-tone. And then, you know, as you build up, if you realize you build up in value to build those planes and, and, and to build a light on the form, if you need to, to build downwards on top, you know, to make, to force the plane to turn downwards towards the shadow that you can't, you can't do it. You can't do you it. Can you can't, do it. you can't do it, but it's, um, not as effective as working the other way. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's. I mean, I, there's so there's like these old rules, these old methods, you know, that that are coming back again now. That, um, you know, that are tried and true, but, you know, but there, but you can. It's not to say that's the only way. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, talk just for a second because you entered. I don't know that it was a new idea to me, but I'd never heard it put that way. But you talked about your. Um, uh, your dark lights. And that's something I think a lot of people that are especially beginning painters or, or, or you know, any kind of uh, artist in general kind of struggle with. Like um, if you're painting, if you're, if you're painting a subject that has a, a, a nice strong shadow shape, it's kind of easy to recognize. But if you're painting a subject that's a lot in the light, like you're painting, up, today. like my painting today, yeah, yeah it, you end up kind of fighting like, well, where there aren't really any Dark, so there's nothing really for me to grab onto and yeah. um and like use as a definite shape, and then you find yourself kind of inventing stuff, and then it turns into a mess. Right. So what? So talk a little bit about the difference between like like how form turns, a little bit about kind of dark lights as opposed to shadow shapes, and how you treat them differently. Yeah. So like you're like if like imagine if you had, you know, uh, you're painting a portrait or a figure or a still life or whatever, if you had like ninety percent light and and like ten percent shadow. You know, there's, you know, and maybe there's like no shadow in the front or something, you know, um, or very just little teeny tiny like structures that might fall in the shadow. Um, you know, you don't have those shadow shapes to really grab onto because, you know, I kept saying this week that the shadow shapes are what ground the drawing, what ground the painting. Everything is built out of that. Um, but if you don't have that, it can still be done because you look at nature and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so obviously if you're looking at it and it works going into your eye, into your brain, it works. So there must be a way to, to make it work on the canvas. 
you just got to figure out how to transpose it. And so what, what, what makes sense to me is that, you know, instead of using the shadow shapes to figure out my, my pattern to build off of, uh, that you can actually use dark lights, you know, or, or mid or mid lights or whatever. You, those are the patterns that you grab onto. Meaning there are areas that the light is hitting. They're just not the highest, um, they're not they're just not the lightest areas they're not the strongest points of light so they're not really right. shadow they're these kind of right and and they're okay mm -hmm. so go, go ahead just in case people didn't know what you were saying by dark lights or what okay. i said about dark lights yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. um so i mean on on in the on the light side of the form right. and then you've got the shadow side of the form but on the light side of the form you've got your you know you, you come out of the shadow and you've got your half tone uh and it's called half tone because it yes so, I don't grab. really like that painting. <laughs> yeah, <it's all> right. <laughs> You're, yeah, well, you can use any. Or here, this one. Or I, we could even. Yeah, that's yeah. there's a half tone right there. If you can see that. Yeah, kind of sort of. And we can we can even drop that's in. That's a half tone. Yeah, yeah. We can drop in, and I'll put a little arrow towards what a half tone is. But it's where the form kind of turns, right? It's like the. It's it's where the light mass is turning away from the light source and is dimming down, mm -hmm. and it continues to dim down, dim down, and at some point it drops into the shadow. So dark light, half tone, are the darker planes in the light mass. And and as far like, say you have, is a dark light always lighter in value than any point of the shadow? Yes. Okay. And so is a half tone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> even depending, even on, if you have some reflected light in the shadow, it still typically should be darker than that area. Nine times out of ten. Okay. Yeah, it's the general rule. You know, they they say you know you, it's uh, um, you know your 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 light dark is always lighter than your. Wait, sorry. Your sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I don't even your, know. Yeah, it. your dark light is always lighter than your than any of your shadow forms. Basically. Yeah, your your uh, your dark light is always. Uh, lighter <laughs> than your dark. <laughs> we should we should have made flashcards for this, huh? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> it's uh. Well, okay, so, here, here's I not here, right. here's so another way. So somebody told me once in a workshop I was teaching. It's like okay, so let me try this. Your dark light is always lighter than your your lightest dark. Okay. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's and then right. somebody else once told me, like, then it stuck in my head. It's like, you never want your, your daytime girlfriend to meet your nighttime girlfriend. Oh, uh, you know? yeah. It's words to live by. That, that, those are words <laughs> to live by. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, and we even, I, I wrote a, sh a short ebook called Tattooed Troubleshooting that these people already know about that are watching the show. But, but one thing that we talk about a lot is, um, is that is foreground, middle ground, background in tattooing, which is a similar idea, meaning like if your darks are in your foreground, the darks in your background should never, if you're using black in your foreground, there should be no black in your background or vice versa. If your black ground is very dark and silhouetted, your darks, your darkest darks of your foreground should never be as dark as, as that background. And you end up with like with a flattening out or like a, some kind of competition, I which see. is the same kind of idea if you end up okay. with the same values does that make sense i think if so you end up with the same values and you're it's like landscape painting a little bit too yeah yeah exact same idea as land you know it'd be like you've like your foreground middle ground background right or right something and, like that, but yeah. um and and so i think i think it's the same idea as that so along the like that's so, cool i don't know a lot about tattooing so yeah I it, the same principles apply it, it the big thing in tattooing is the is <laughs> is contrast you don't get a lot of subtlety doesn't live well in the skin for years and years and years so you really have to push contrast further than you're comfortable uh, so you might um like where that transition you're talking about where your um your half tone meets your core shadow meets your whatever you might simplify that to something more stark just mm -hmm. just for the long for the sake of longevity mm -hmm. you know right um but otherwise it's you know it's a, the same rules apply so you know how they say duh, like um what's the term paint paint what you see not what you know but but mm -hmm. so you have these schools that have yeah. these like very strict kind of rules of thought and is there a tendency or is there a, a danger of getting so caught up in those ideas that you're painting what you think you know instead of what you're looking at does that make any sense like if you if you just say like all right well my my darkest light is always lighter than my light is dark I think if I you just that, if yeah. you just know that <clears throat> does it sometimes keep you from looking at what you're actually trying to render and, it could. and drawing what you see, you're painting what you see. It could. I, I could see that happening. Sure. Especially if you're just sort of blindly following right. these 
rules or principles, you know, yeah, certainly, it certainly could. So you just, yeah. Say, but at the same time, like those rules, I think that they're intended to help you to understand what you're seeing. Right. But they could do also that. You could be kind of, it could trap you in a box, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So when, <clears throat> especially in, in time, in like areas of confusion where you reach a point in a painting where you're struggling with just re- rendering the form or make or something's flattening out on you or whatever that that's when you really call upon those things like for the most part you're kind of looking and painting what you see and then whenever you're i would say i'm doing both at the same time are you yeah okay. i think it's good to kind of do both of, yeah okay like every decision i make i feel like i'm tapping into both sides of my brain which one side is like the the you know the right side which is you know just purely perceptual and just seeing like, you know, just taking it in and just thinking about it almost abstractly. And then the other side is the understanding part, like asking the questions, well, why am I seeing it that way? You know, and then you start analyzing it. And so like almost like every shape or every stroke has, has if, I think when I'm painting my best, it has both of those two things happening at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That makes sense. Um, t- and, uh, I'm sorry to everybody if this, if this show is getting like super technical, it'll be just for, <laughs> it'll be just for the actual like painting or, or like hardcore realism tattoo nerds. But, uh, uh, but that's cool. That's, um, what about those are our little, people, right? those are our people. That's who we're looking for. Uh, what about, um, uh, form shadows as opposed to cast shadows? We've talked a little bit about that in the, um, uh, in the workshop. Um, how do you say what? And the pool hall and in the workshop. Uh, so oh, yeah, we were looking at the pool balls. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yep. Carrie loves to draw... Um, balls. Spe- balls. He loves to draw balls. <laughs> so, like, if you... Yeah, <laughs> Carrie loves balls, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you... Uh, Ding! <laughs> okay. Um. If, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Me too. We do. We do have. We have a, a live studio audience today. If you guys can't tell, if, if anyone's listening on iTunes and they're like, "Why do they just keep stopping for random reasons?" It's because there are people behind us. Um, so, uh, so we're talking about my balls. We're talking about balls. We're talking about your tendency to, um, and, and you do. I mean, you've done it a handful of times already. Like when you're teaching people how the form turns everyone's paintings has little yeah little <clears throat> spheres drawn in them where and so that's um so that's basically what you're doing is you're, you're trying to break everything down into the simplest idea yeah i mean uh uh the ball is i mean i'm not i did not invent this yeah uh, uh, <laughs> i've seen i've actually seen it before believe it or not that's uh yeah <laughs> the ball yes the ball um, yeah um but you know it's 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 really ideal because um, you know, you get a very basic, simple object and you put a light, one main dominant light source on it and you, you can see, uh, you know, how the light interacts with a very simple object and you can see the different, this one isn't fully, uh, uh, val- or plain, you know, you don't have all the values. The, the light here is still pretty, um, left open, but you have all these different, uh, you know, lights and darknesses as the light diminishes across, the surface of the ball drops into shadow and then gets dark and then gets lighter, gets more reflection. You get the cast shadow. This is the form shadow. So these are ideas that have been around for hundreds of years. And, you know, as artists would like stare at basic, um, you know, was, would look at a ball under a dominant light source and they would begin to understand what was happening. And then those things turned into principles and turned in and became lessons that were handed down. So if you can understand how light interacts with form on a basic, on a ball, then, um, that gives you uh, the basic understanding. And then every time you look at a any surface, whether it's a still life or a portrait, you know, painting the ball, the nose or, mm-hmm. or anything, you see those same planes, those same, uh, uh, you know, the same interaction of light on the surface happening over and over and over again. And so in a portrait, <laughs> you're basically just connecting a lot of already interconnected shapes and making that happen yeah. repetitively. And, yeah. uh, uh, and yeah. I, I think that's important. And I, and even going back to, to drawing that sphere, I know a ton of pretty good tattooers that, that could really gain a lot by going back and doing that. Because as, as tattooers, a lot of times we invent our compositions because they just, because we can't make them happen and draw them from life, you know, it's sure. a lot of invented things. Sure. And, um, and it's really obvious to me, the people who, um, I mean, it's a little more illustrative, I guess it's, it's illustrative, but it still has to, um, I, mean, I love illustrations. So well, yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. It still has to follow <clears throat> those guidelines. I mean, it, it has to look believable. Sure. Objects have to look like they could live in the same space. Right. And it's amazing how many times I see pretty competent tattooers, like technical 
technically competent tattooers that have inconsistent light sources and um and it's just mm. because maybe they're pulling up separate images in google google image searches and drawing right. them and they're drawing them f- like literally from what they're seeing and then they're neglecting to look at the whole when they finish a, a composition and right. maybe you know then they're lit from different places and so you have these really in, like crazy inconsistencies <clears throat> in light source and the thing i try to stress to people that, that we talk to is it's like even it doesn't take an artist to recognize that anyone that looks at that tattoo will know something isn't right about it they might not know what but their eyes recognize mm-hmm. like ah, that's mm-hmm. weird but i sure. can't tell you why sure. and so something as simple as drawing shapes like spheres or cubes or whatever and understanding how light actually works yeah uh is just is so valuable uh yeah. and, and that's why we try to talk to you know to people like you because <clears throat> so many tattooers don't go to painting work or don't paint at all so or working from life you know anytime life, you yeah. work from life and you put yeah, one I dominant paint but yeah, yeah, yeah you, work from life yeah, yeah yeah anytime you put a dominant light source on anything mm-hmm. you're gonna see you're gonna see how things act in nature yeah and nature's always you know always the the ultimate you know teacher Right, right. Okay, yeah, because people, that's all you see all day. So when something right. doesn't follow nature, it looks wrong to you, even if you can't tell you know, exactly why it is. Um, uh, I had a question and I just lost it. But um, go, oh, uh, the the core shadow versus the um, the, the cast shadow. How, how do you address those differently from a technical standpoint, just so people get an idea? And explain what the, what the two are. Uh, okay. I, I, you just kind of did. The core shadow is where the form actually turns. right. The cast shadow is uh, the 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 edge of the the shadow that's cast by the form onto exactly. onto something else or onto exactly. another plane. That's it. Yeah. Um, so, how do you address those differently in your painting? Um, as far as edges, as far as uh, well, so I mean, and here um, the the this is the uh, you know the the form shadow or the cast or the court and this this dark band here is I don't know this is what I call it. You know, you mm-hmm. kind of get different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the form shadow is the shadow on the underside of the form, which is, again, why we go back to the ball, because it just is a very simple form to study this stuff. Um, so the form shadow is the underside of the ball versus the cast shadow being cast by the form onto another surface. And again, you can see that happening on anything, you know, any surface, whether it's a portrait over and over again. Um, so, so the cat, sorry, the, the cast shadow. Just by looking at the way that you've rendered that nose right there, the cast shadow is a little, sh- a yeah. flatter, sharper finishes so sharper. In, in general, your sharpest edges are so the oh, form shadow. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the form the form shadow will always have a softer edge between right. the light and the shadow. That form shadow edge, called the terminating edge or the terminator, or also some some schools call it the bed bug line. Um, Gross. <laughs> they really uh, call it the bed bug line. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh. Um, apparently, bed bugs never go into the light, so that's uh. why they call it that. I've heard that you look into the bend of the mattress for bed bugs, like into the seam. Yeah, right that's disgusting. That's a terrible <laughs> thing to call it. Um, so, and then that's a, well, that's the, a softer okay. edge, All right? But it sticks in your head. Yeah, right? no, yeah, I'll remember <laughs> it now. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and that, so that that right, yeah. <laughs> That edge between the light and shadow is is always a little softer. Um, um, always, but you always want to be careful not to overblend, which I've been saying over and right. over again this week. But compared to your cast shadow edge, your cast shadow edges tend to be sharper. Um, the closer they are to the source, the sharper they are, and as they get further away, the sharper edge begins to get a little blurry. Okay. And and contours are, are a little bit firmer as well. So. So, yeah. so in a portrait, pretty often, you know, your strong cast shadows might be the shadow cast from the nose onto right. the uh, top lip, or yeah. or, or from the um, from the chin down onto the neck, and and yep. those will tend to be pretty like sharper than you might think they are, really. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you hear I, I've heard painters before saying that there are no um, there are no truly like sharp edges, but uh, and I, I and I. And I've tried to follow that. Actually, I've tried to soften edges or break edges a lot. But there are times that you just really need a crisp edge, right? Yes. I mean, just it, it, I think so. Yeah. Like I've seen paintings by like Georgia O'Keeffe. She did this. I saw this one painting by her, or I've seen any other other painters who will tend to uh, build their paintings where every you know there's still 
uh, being very planar and blocky. You know, they're not over blending, but but they're avoiding any overly sharp edges. And then they'll come back at the end of the painting and pop a few sharp edges, and they'll just pop out of the painting. And there's there's something kind of magical about it. Um, uh, it can kind of save a painting sometimes. Like you think a painting is going in the wrong direction, and sometimes a few sharp edges yeah. just change it. Yeah. yeah, it just like pops it into reality all of a sudden somehow. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've learned really not to give up on paintings for that exact reason. I have a tendency to be to use a lot of paint and to use a lot of big heavy marks. I like for paint to look like paint, but then sometimes yeah. it tends to get kind of you have crazy. a very painterly style. Very yeah, very yeah, which painterly. Is beautiful. But thank sorry, you, go thank ahead. You. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love though to uh, sometimes I really feel like it's getting out of hand, and then you'll just literally make a single mark or two that you're just like oh that shape makes sense now uh and and it sure. usually is just some like crisp clean shape yeah. uh um yeah go, going back to the light source i um you you talked about using a single light source to to illustrate how light actually works and that is exactly why we talk so much about um about how important it is in tattooing to use a a single light source and not try to use multiple light sources. It's a, it's complex enough as it is because it wraps multiple planes and you're you're drawing to a space that's not really a flat space and you often can't see the entire image from one vantage point, you know? And so mm -hmm. so a lot of times people will try to get fancy and they'll introduce multiple lights or backlighting or different light sources and I think it's such a tricky thing to pull off in, in tattooing and um and uh, not not even to get your opinion on that i just wanted to make a i just wanted yes. to make a point because you talked yeah. about the, how important using the sphere to to illustrate yeah. how light actually works um is tattooing similar to like comic comic books illustration is there a similarity yeah. oh yeah most almost every tattooer i know is a huge yeah. comic book okay. nerd and, and learned to draw from comic books yeah, uh, love comic books yeah yeah <laughs> um and uh and they lend themselves really well to each other uh, just because um comics are typically you know obviously very illustrative and uh and have a lot of stark contrast and things like right. that because they have to read well in a small right panel and um because i would think that comic books would follow a I mean, I'm sure they break the rules, you know, as they yeah. need to, but I'm sure that they would try to follow the rules of like, you know, where's the light coming from mm -hmm. and is it, does it make sense cohesively within the space or yeah. something yeah. to that effect? Yeah. And I think comics, are, they exaggerate, um, uh, contrast and temperature and stuff like that or you'll have a really really warm light and then a super super cool sure. backlight and stuff like that and that stuff translates to tattooing pretty well uh, yeah i think too um uh so what um uh, just out of curiosity, what, how much time do you spend teaching as opposed to painting for yourself? Is it a even kind of split or? Um, I, I, I basically, I do work one day, uh, uh, like five day, three day and five day workshops around the country. Yeah. Um, coming to a town near you, coming but, uh, uh, um, a couple of those every year. And then, um, how, just a good, what, two but, or three a year or how many? I probably, right, like last year I probably did about eight. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm, okay. I'm, yeah, so, and then, but on my regular schedule, I'll, I teach one day a week. It's a very full day. I teach three days, uh, sorry, three classes, classes in one day. So I have six days to sit around and, you know, just not sit around. But yeah, but to work. <laughs> yeah. To do, you know, the other things that I'm interested in doing. Yeah. Yeah. Is your goal to... Um, to just paint and sell your own work, or do you really enjoy teaching? Do you think you'll always teach? I'll probably always teach. Yeah, I like the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where if if people want to find you, where do they go to find you? What's the best? Um, my website, which is carrydunn dot com, and K E R R Y. Yeah. And if they're curious about Studio and Cominati, where's yeah, um, yeah, just hit their hit their website, Studio and Cominati, which is. I'm, I'll try to do this. I N C A M M I N A T I. That sounds right. If not, we'll drop it. Look right here. That's where it'll be, right yeah. behind, in front of these uh, growlers. Um, uh, and and so, as far as the workshops go, you book some through Studio and Cominati, some on your sure. own. Yeah, yeah. I still do them through through the school, but I uh, but I also do them on my own. So I do both. Yeah. And for the Memphis artists, like the four Memphis artists that actually support their local podcast. 
assholes. Uh, you should uh, keep your eyes open because Adam and I, are, are Adam Shaw, who's actually, I didn't even give Adam credit. Did, did it just go off? I didn't even give Adam credit. Uh, we, Adam's doing, been doing something He's doing sweet. awesome. He's pushing yeah. the buttons and stuff, and he's got headphones on. Uh, Adam has been on the show twice, and he, uh, and this is his first time behind the camera because our regular crew couldn't make it down here for a five-day workshop. Uh, but Adam and I want to start putting on some workshops maybe in Memphis, and we're going to try to, uh, yeah, should. we're going to try to rope Carrie into coming down, so keep your, and Christina yeah. into coming down and, uh, be in our workshop guinea pigs because, uh, we don't know, we don't know who's going to show up. Uh, there are no, there are no creative people in Memphis, right? Am I right about that? It's just yeah, just a bunch of rednecks. Uh, CarrieDunn.com, StudioIncominati.com. You can go to either. If you go to Studio in Cominati, they have an In Your Town Workshop tab. It might be dot .org. Dot .org? Okay. StudioIncominati.org, I think. Yeah. Whatever was down here, do that. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, In Your Town Workshops, and then you can click on Carrie, and it'll show where he's going. Um, I, so I do some through them, but I do also do some on my own. So my website is where Your I'm website going. has those as well, and, that, and people will contact you directly. Yeah, you can email me, whatever, yeah. To do that. Is there anything we forgot? Did I leave anything out? What what kind of yeah, what are you doing in your work right now? Is it all por portrait uh, work? I'm I'm working on some larger nudes. Um yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to I love painting portraits. Yeah. Love it. But um uh, uh but I'm kind of interested in just doing some larger nude paintings and just spending a year or two doing that and then and then we'll see where I'll see where I'm at. You said that you like illustration a handful of times. Do you do any illustration at all? No, I, no, uh, uh but no. I, but I remember like I was an illustration major in college. Oh, oh. and 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 I kind of got out and I was like well, after college I was like I think I want to do portraits and I went looking for a teacher and it took me down that whole road. But um, but I still love illustration. It's very creative. Yeah, you know, which sometimes painting from life, in the classical sense, can be a little not as creative mm -hmm. because they, there's certain conventions. Yeah. That's what I love about illustration is it's just their creative aspects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, uh, I, I get asked a lot if uh, because I paint more and more and I tattoo less and less if I'm ever going to quit tattooing and try to be a full-time painter. And I just I don't see it happening for that exact reason. I love like yeah. I love inventing information. I love I love yeah. the collaboration process because it's always incredible to to have a consultation with someone and then and they throw this crazy idea out uh, based right. on something that they've seen that you've done before. Just like they like. I don't know something stylistically they they like about something you've done, and they come in and they throw this crazy idea out, and then it's up to you to like to make it work and to collaborate, and it's like and it probably stretches you, it pushes you out, yeah, it kind of, ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And, and especially the way that tattooing has gone now, where people are more trusting of their artists and they give a lot of kind of creative freedom. Um, so they may come in with a fairly strict idea and then you start roughing out some things and they're like, oh yeah, I'm completely open to that. So it, it becomes a really cool kind of collaborative cool. process. And so I, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. But as someone that doesn't paint from life all the time, to me at this point, that is something that is, uh, that's held my attention really, really well, just because, uh, why, why do you think that is? Uh, because I, you know, I, I guess I grew up drawing, but either from out of my head, either out of my head or from photographs. Mm -hmm. And so life has presented such a challenge to me. Uh, and uh, uh, there's just so much subtlety that it forces you to make decisions. It forces you to kind of like decide what you what you want to include, what's necessary, what's not necessary uh, in, you know, in a composition or in a brush stroke or in anything in between. And um, uh, that's really interesting just because I it's – it's just something I've never been introduced to. I think the other hard thing is that, you know, when you're used to painting out of your head or from photographs, um, like the photograph is already flat and everything. Right. So, and then when you go to painting from real life, it's like you're dealing with a three-dimensional thing and it's harder to, you know, but if you could, it's harder to do that for that reason. But if you have learned to do it from a flat surface to a flat surface, I've always found what helps me is to imagine the three-dimensional world as if it were flat. So in a way, yeah. like you're transposing these flat relationships to a flat surface, even though it's three dimensional. Yeah. But that can be a little bit hard to do because we've got, you know, our, our vision is set up for three dimensionality. So. Right, right. And, the, and there is a lot, of, <laughs> especially in shadows, I found there's just so much more information in shadows in life than there is in shadows yes. in, in photography or in, uh, in and, yeah and so that's been a challenge for me is like well what do i really what's important what am i trying to get out of that shadow or what do i need to say to to let people know what that form's doing in that shadow so. yeah and that's another good reason why it's always good to go back 
and work from life as much as you can anytime you get an opportunity because, you know, our eyes operate differently than a camera does. And so when you're able to work from life or from nature, you begin to learn the way nature works, the way our eyes and brain work. And then when you go back to the photograph, you can use what you learn from life to fill in what the camera uh, doesn't get. Right, right. Which happens all the time. I, I remember talking, uh, we podcasted with Jeff Hine a few months ago, and he paints exclusively from life. And I asked yeah. him, like, do you think that... Um, can you I asked him if can you always tell when someone painted from a photograph or if they painted from life and he thought he could most of the time and i was like well can you tell when you do it and he was like nah i don't think anyone could tell if i do it because i've painted so much from life exactly. that i know how to translate a photograph to a life painting like exactly. i just know what it right what it is right so um i'm not to that point yet I'm getting, I'm not to that point. Yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, guys, go to Fireside, ta or no, TattooImprovement.com, and, um, you know, do all that stuff I said at the first of the show. Uh, we probably need to cut it off. We got beer to drink. Thanks again yes, to Barley do. and Barrels, or what's that called? Barrel and Beers and Titties? What is it? I don't know. That's not right. Uh, I don't know, but if it is, we're going back. <laughs> Let's yeah. go back. <laughs> Beersandtitties.com. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Carrie. That was awesome. Really. You guys have a good night. <laughs>